Four score and seven years ago, our forefathers brought forth upon this continent a new nation conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Welcome to the Nurse Surgery Podcast. I'm Mike Wang, and I'm here with my co-host, J.P. Colson. We are here to discuss all things neurosurgical. Hi, this is J.P. Colson, a resident in neurosurgery at Rush University. Please note that this is not a CME event, and the opinions and statements made in this podcast do not reflect those of any institution or professional organization. Now, let's get started. So today's guest is Lou Tumialan. Lou is a master spine surgeon at the Faro Neurological. He trained at Emory. He's a good friend of mine. Uh, Welcome to the show, Lou. Thanks for having me. It's a privilege to be here. Great. John Paul and I have followed your career uh, for some time now. But let me just start by saying that many of our listeners may not know that you've had an extensive, substantial background in the U.S. military. And maybe you could tell us about that a little bit. Yes, you know, my, my career in the military, more by accident than by design, timed itself with the uh, 9-11 attacks is kind of how I would mark my, my career in the military. I finished my uh, internship in the Navy. I had the, uh, at the Naval Medical Center in San Diego, and I was one of the guys who, during internship, decided to switch from becoming an orthopedic surgeon to a neurosurgeon. The Navy says, we have a category and a place for people who change their minds. And they assigned me to an operational tour. Uh, and so because they didn't have me billeted to, to switch into there. So um, I became a dive medical officer. Uh, and in that, uh, that became submarine school in Groton, Connecticut, and dive school in Panama City, Florida. And then I received a set of orders to go to a sleepy outpost in Guam, the Naval Special Warfare mm-hmm. Unit 1 out in Guam. And then 9-11 happened, and that sleepy outpost became a very busy center of operations, and we found ourselves... Uh, in uh, having to support several missions around Southeast Asia because before Iraq started in in March of 2003, we had the Philippines, we had Thailand, we had uh, things going on with India and Pakistan, we had Korea always, and uh, these are the uh, uh, missions that uh, the Naval Special Warfare uh, supported, and as a dive medical officer, I would either augment or support or or help out, and that's where I got a real insight of what it was like to work on a remarkable team. And it it is impossible to dismiss the impact that that had on my views in life, my views in teamwork, my views in medicine. Um, And it's been a very strong contributor to everything that I have brought to any organization, whether it's the spine section, uh, whether it's uh, my own family, whether it's the uh, whether it's my practice and my uh, working with my colleagues, uh, elements of that leadership style, the teamwork style, is uh, and OR efficiencies. These are all things that I've incorporated into uh, the practice. And that is the topic for today, which is how to make yourself more efficient in the OR. But I want to go, because you brought up so many good points. Um, tell, tell us about that, how that time galvanized some of your, I don't want to say ideology, but maybe your principles or framework, maybe? It's the, you know, I I could not put my finger on what I was experiencing when I was asked to augment a a platoon of Navy SEALs. Uh, I remember one mission to Sri Lanka where um, I I augmented a SEAL Team 5 hotel platoon. And the, uh, what what that transformed me, I think that was a transformative uh, deployment for me because I said, how are you guys getting all of this done? And it was just so automatic for them. It was a seasoned platoon, but I just became lockstep with them. And I could not put my finger on how that culture or how to describe that culture until I read Stanley McChrystal's book, Team of Teams, where uh, Stanley McChrystal described the shared consciousness where everyone knows what it is that we, we know the larger mission and we know our own subset. And then we, we work endlessly and tirelessly on how to accomplish that. And as a result, the whole, the whole project becomes even comes to fruition in a much stronger light than otherwise you could imagine. 
And part of that, I know, you know, leading up to the deployment, we were playing ultimate football together. We were doing water polo. We were all, we were, and we were going, we were going out to dinner. You end up developing friendships. And then, but then when you, when the rubber meets the road and you're in theater, you, you, you work tirelessly in your own individual department. And then you come together for our, our meetings again. And, and that is, is the strong, that is where the strength of these teams developed. And I think Stanley McChrystal really, covered that beautifully in a way that I could not articulate, but if anyone could, it would be McChrystal, a, a, four, a four-star general like like him, who saw that in theater and, and was responsible for really turning around elements of, of the insurgency in Iraq. But that's what I saw, and, and, and that's something that can be taken anywhere. That can yeah. be taken to a, a high school football team. That can I, I take those principles to the Boy Scout troop for my, for my boys, for my practice, for, my, for the colleagues I work with, for my little platoons that I developed for the spine section, for the, uh, for the scientific program committee. But never to, it, it, it's, it's, you have to see it in, in motion. You have to see it in that concept of shared consciousness where everyone knows what to do, and you don't necessarily need to tell them how to do A, B, and C. They know what D is supposed to look like, and you rely on them. And it's that reliance and that trust that is built that ends up becoming part of a larger, the sum of, the, the sum of its parts much grow, greater. I love what McChrystal's done. I feel like that Netflix movie about him, played, I think it was Brad Pitt played him, did him a real disservice. I mean, I, I've read about him. He, he only eats one meal a day, right? He's really a master of discipline. And I think that for, for our listeners out there, I mean, you know, if you haven't read that book, Team of Teams, I think it's, it's important. Um, yeah, there's so many things we can talk about. I want to go back to ortho again, but, but we are talking about this whole environment thing. And, and just a shout out, I mean, uh, John Paul, you turned, on to me, it turned me on to a podcast, right? The, um, the Jocko podcast. The Jocko podcast. I love the Jocko podcast, you know, Jocko Willink. Navy SEAL, and uh, it, it's, you know, really, one day we got to get him on this podcast, yeah. right? Yeah. So he often talks about this concept, which I, I think you were leaning towards of decentralized command, where when you have someone on your team, instead of saying, do this, 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 and that, you just say, accomplish this task and let them figure out how to do it and trust that they will. So the, the obvious direction that we'd like to take this is how do you apply this to your OR environment? What specific ways have you found to inculcate that sense of teamwork um, in your OR team? Yeah, uh, and to, to answer that, I'm going to take one step back to, to, to then march into that question, and that is advice that one of my dear friends, uh, Dana DeCosta, who just retired after 20 years of, of being a Navy SEAL and, and five combat deployment, uh, five combat deployments that he had. Um, he mentioned, he spoke at our, uh, one of our sessions, and I'll never forget what he said. And he's, uh, one of his rules, uh, leadership rules, is always invest in human capital. Mm. Always invest in human capital. Nothing will give you better returns. And so to inculcate that, you have to identify like-minded individuals because seed needs to fall on fertile soil. But once you identify that individual who you want to be part of your team, you show them the trust. You 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 empower that individual. You 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 make sure that it is a that they recognize the respect that you have for them. Whether it's a fluoroscopic technician, whether it is a uh, the the scrub nurse, the scrub tech, whether it is your OR nurse. But in order to do that, you've got to show them what the bigger picture looks like. They're not just passing instruments. They are passing instruments for the patient who's under mm -hmm. and under anesthesia. They're passing instruments because that's someone's mom, someone's dad, who needs to get back to life. It may be a mom who has four children, all of who are in their waiting room, and the father's losing his mind because he's lost the horsepower to his engine because his wife can't walk because she's got a radiculopathy. It's not just, oh, it's just an L5S1 microdiscectomy. You can't say that to the man out there who's got right. his four children now. It, that is the most important case. And so when, when the fluoroscopic technician you knows mean, I'm that, sorry, you mean every case is the most important every case. Every case is the most important case. But as we know, we, we stack our more complex cases first, and then there's a temptation for the OR staff, which if we communicate that mission, they don't say that. They say, oh, we don't talk like that. We, meaning part of the team. But there's a temptation for perhaps the anesthesiologist or perhaps the, uh, the, the scheduling to say, hey, it's just this. No, it's not just that. It's just as important as the, as the intradural extramedullary tumor we took out. And then once they see the bigger mission, once they get it, that they're saying, hey, we're getting trust with, this, with the care, 
then all of a sudden we, we empower our scrub technician to say, you know what, I'm going to stay a little bit later. Or the fluoroscopic technician is not going um, uh, to stay or say, hey, look, it's three o'clock, I got to go. Because sometimes you have to add on a case because we have that shared consciousness. Yeah. But you have, to, you, you, you have to trust them, show them, empower them, trust them, show them that you trust them. And then all of a sudden you do build that, that shared consciousness of taking care of the patient, which is transformative. Okay, so, so that all makes sense. But like, let's just draw the parallel of the American military and the American healthcare system. So you're working with the SEAL teams, you're in the teams. But if you were in the Navy at large, and no criticism to the folks that are, you know, mainline, whatever they're doing, right? You are the elite subgroup of those folks in the in the fighting arena. So in neurosurgery, I mean, I, we kind of always say that, like right? we're like the Navy SEALs of medicine. But the reality is, you're working in this hospital system. It's like working for the U.S. Navy, right? And you don't necessarily get a pick. I mean, what do you you put your scrub text through Hell Week? Like, like right. we don't necessarily get a pick. Like, oh, you got to sign, you know, Joe Smith, and this guy is the person nobody wants to work with. How do you like? What do you do? Yeah. So uh, there, there's a couple um, one two threes immediately. For example, anything, anytime something bad happens in the OR. Immaterial of the origin of it, you say, this is my fault. That way you work on fixing the problem, not the blame. If the mm -hmm. scrub drops something that you need, you say, don't worry about that. That was my fault. And you, and then you, then, th then it's, it's those little moments that allow you to build the trust. If they drop something and you, you handle it differently, and you have to wait, you know, we're all gonna be waiting 12 minutes for the thing to flash. Then all of a sudden it changes the dynamic in the room. Everyone reacts to it. Okay, I, I wanna push back a little bit because this is a very important point, okay? Because we all struggle with this. So I'll tell you what I do and you tell me if I'm fucking it up, okay? Can you say that on this podcast? Of course I can. Oh, wonderful. Yes. Okay. So, so my kids can't listen to the podcast. No, of course they can. They've heard it before. I, something tells me your kids have heard that <laughs> word before. We actually had a conversation okay. about this, yes. So. What I do, and this is, I'm well known for this, and I'm going to say it because people who know me know this. I, I live in a university, it's a little different. I, I work for University of Miami, and I live in an environment where I have very little control, but I can control things through non, through alternative means. So I create an environment where essentially everybody is terrified of me, even though I'm actually in reality, as you know, not terrifying at all. I couldn't imagine. Right. I, honestly, I couldn't. And what it does is it scares away the bad or incompetent people. And what happens is the really nice surgeons, like an ENT, the guys who never yell, raise their voice, they get all the, I hate to even say it like this, but the guys who just can't cut it because they're not going to complain. And not that I'm complaining. I don't complain administratively. I just create a, the, the aura of the environment that it's scary. And then people who don't even know me, like, I don't want to work in that room. But then the people that are in the fold, once they're in, we go to dinner, I mean, we get Christmas gifts. Like, we're like a family. I'll do anything for those people. That's my vision of what Navy SEALs are like. They put the high barrier to entry, entry right? Hell Week and all that, BUDS training. And then once you're in, you're like family. But you're saying something very different to me, which I'm fascinated by because I think I'm totally screwing it up. Well, I, I, I think that at the end of the day, we've accomplished the same objective. I don't know if it's true or not. I'm, I'm, but if you, if, because you are building that team. And so you've accomplished that, you've accomplished it a different way. And then you've just created a filter. The filter that I, b before I get there, I have already, there are people who are going to be like-minded, I've, I've communicated my mission, I've communicated what we're trying to do. For example, I have a, I have a darling scrub nurse who is, in, she's incredibly talented and very loyal to me um, and stays, she's coming on Saturdays, but um, that didn't happen on accident. It, it, it built trust and, and so her, I will, I, I, we, she's in the inner fold, right? Um, the thing is that there, there's, Philosophically, the operating theater is the sanctuary of the patient, and there's there's no time for uh, me to expend, and that's just my philosophical approach. There's no there's no time uh, for me to expend using negative energy. I need to get the patient in and out of the operating room, and and again, there's several different ways to to do that. Um, 
I, I think that getting that filter, again, there, what, what you mentioned earlier, if I can take a step back, not to confuse the, the conversation with this, but you, you said, I have few things that I can control. You mentioned that. Right, I work at a university. Right. Yeah. And so I had a skipper who um, I remember going through all of these things saying, you know, I'm worried about this. What about that? Um, you, know, I, what, you know, if we're here and I need to do a medevac, what am I? And he said, Doc, forget about everything you're at. Control the controllables. Hmm. Hmm. Control Good. the controllables. That's all. It bears repeating. Then you focus your energy on those things you can control. So if there's things that I can't control and I waste energy there, then I've then I've lost time and energy and manpower and an opportunity to control the things I can control. If I can only control those things I can control, then I invest all of my time there. So it, it sounds like you're accomplishing the same things. There's no one way of doing any of these things. We all find our path. Um, but I want to hear about how you do it because you do it better than me. So you've mentioned two things that I've identified. One is you build a circle of trust. That is, people can feel confident that you're going to be the leader and you're going to take responsibility and they feel comfortable with you. And the second thing is you empower them, right? So you, so those two go well together. But what else? There's got to be more to it, right? Like so what do you do to get your... The, 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 the hierarchy gradient. So we, we know Malcolm Gladwell wrote in, um, I, I believe it's Blink, where he... Uh, discussed the casualties that were happening in the Korean airlines, which proportionally was out of, uh, out of bounds with what other airlines were experiencing. And what was identified was that the, the hierarchy gradient was such that the co-pilot, who was junior to the senior pilot, was reluctant to say anything despite, he, right. despite the fact that that pilot knew that what they were doing was going the wrong way. I was in Guam. I saw the uh, the Korean air the the side of the mountain that the Korean airline hit. You can still find pieces of the wreckage there, and so that really hit the point. How do you fly into a mountain if one pilot there knew that that was the wrong course? The solution there was get rid of the hierarchy greeting. How do they do it? They taught the pilots English. In the OR, you've got to communicate to the OR nurse if you don't feel if you don't look at the film. So my OR nurses are taught to look at the films, they're taught to scroll to the right pedicle, they're taught to uh, confirm the laterality. Uh, they should be saying, yes, you have marked the symptomatic side of the patient. Uh, the, it matches the consent, it ma and they should feel comfortable saying, um, have you, show me, the film, show me where that disc herniation is. They should feel comfortable saying, because someday they'll say, they'll feel comfortable going, I don't think you've marked the right side of the patient. They should not be afraid because I, we've all had to do a root cause analysis where someone read the consent that said the correct laterality of the patient uh, symptoms and the surgeon marked and operated still on the wrong side. And so at some point, someone, whether it's the anesthesiologist, whether it's the OR nurse, whether it's the scrub nurse, in the OR, in my opinion, there should be no hierarchy gradient. The uh, scrub nurse who I, is, in, is in the trust uh, and understands the procedure should be able to be feel comfortable looking at the, the the MRI should be up on the screen for everyone to see the you look at all these checks and balances that can happen the OR nurse who has been looking at scans now for the last four years with me um, my scrub nurse who is not a scrub tech she happens to be a scrub nurse also looks at it we all go over it together as part of our huddle and so the hierarchy grading is dispelled. We empower the individuals to be part of, again, that shared consciousness of doing what? Taking care of that patient under anesthesia. I love it. I love it. You what, go ahead, John Paul. What, can you think of something throughout your career that you used to do that you stopped? A behavior that you've changed that you think has improved your team dynamic in the OR? Yeah, it's, it's, it's um, wasting energy on it's listening to the advice that I had which I've had all this advice um, fermenting in me for years because I, I, I left active duty in the operate in the operational realm in 2003 but what happens is that we end up as residents we mimic our attendants right mm. we, we we will we will find ourselves um, like I would uh, I would bring out my uh, Daniel Lewis Barrow when I'm doing an aneurysm or I if I'm doing a pituitary all of a sudden I transmouse myself into Nelson Oishiku um, if I was doing a tumor I became uh, James Jeffrey Olson and all of them had their idiosyncrasies they were not me I was a, a facsimile of them mm. though and but being and these are all 
tremendous surgeons, all fantastic, all gifted surgeons, but they were not me. So I would say that more, more than the behavior, it was allowing just being myself in the operating room as opposed to trying to be someone else. Um, because I even would, would have the uh, English accent of Nelson Oishiku, <laughs> whom you just heard in your podcast earlier. So, um, but I would imitate him. I would still be, uh, anytime I would be doing cases that would remind me of him. Uh, but finding things that work in your own, I mean, a lot of things, it, it's, all, it's all human interaction. And so what we find that work with our, certain things I've learned 15 years of marriage, that doesn't work with my wife. Right. So it's all human interaction. Same thing. These are people who go home to their families and talk to people about their day. How was your day? Oh, I had to do a case with Lou Tumi Allen. Oh, how did that go? Or can they say, no, I had, I had Tumi Allen today. So it was a, it was a good day. There is a, um, the, one of the authors that has presented at the CNS, uh, has, uh, uh, discussed the, uh, he, he wrote a book called uh, the resilient physician. And he said, what reaction do people have when you walk into the room? Hmm. Look around and see what, what kind of, what, what, what happens to people's reaction, whether it's walking into your house and your children. I remember that because I'd be on call being a foul mood and I'd walk in and I could feel that I affected the, an otherwise happy climate in, um, in the house. And I'll never forget, I'm very grateful to, to that author because um, it changed, that's one thing, whether it's the OR, I have to, um, externalize what the outside world is doing to me. So I don't bring that into my home or the OR or um, interactions and meetings, um, which is at times hard to do. I mean, you take seven days of trauma call, you're talking to a family of the grandfather who went to go get a soccer ball off the roof um, on the way down. He happens to be on Zeralta, Eloquist and Coumadin and fall, take, has a single episode, falls, hits his head. Next thing you know, you're rounded on him for two weeks. The family's upset. They're angry. They're angry at everyone, but because their loved one is not going to do well. Then you have the kid on the green scooter who has uh, on his way to law school. He has a traumatic brain injury. This has, it, it's, it's hard to uh, impact how much those things uh, affect the way we interact then subsequently with our families, uh, how we interact with our uh, the staffs around. And the one thing I would say that I have changed is I have not mastered, because you don't want to externalize too much, but you have to externalize some of these things so that they don't, they don't affect um, how you conduct yourself in the operating theater for the patients under anesthesia, for when you get home and your um, son is asking for help with homework and you're short-tempered with him, or you um, have to coach soccer and you just don't have it for the eight-year-olds that are just wow. being eight-year-olds. Lou, I could talk to you forever because I feel like I do everything exactly the opposite as you of you. And I don't even remember from my chair's address earlier this year, I talk about how I integrate everything into my life and there's no, there's like no border between my personal and professional life. And we could talk forever and we, we've got to... We've, we've got to get to that. And I want to get back to ortho at some point too and how you're going to be an orthopedic surgeon. But I want to finish by asking an important question. About 70% of new grads now are hospital employees. These are the people, I would say, even less than me. I'm sorry. These are the people that have even less control probably than me at a university. Like they were working for a big corporation, right? If you could give them some advice. I know your situation, my situation different from them. If you were to, to, to talk to one of your former residents and they're working for, I don't know, HCA, for example, right? And they're like, I can't get anything done in the OR. People aren't, you know, turnovers of three hours, whatever. What would be like your top three piece of advice for those folks? Because that's most of the people now that are coming out. All right. Well, I mean, I, I, I'd start by the conversation by saying, uh, let's look at the statistics of surgeons who are hospital employed and their longevity in that position. And but that's, that's not the answer to your question. So um, again, control the controllables, um, work, reach out to the administration. I have not done all of this independently. It's not like I carved, I, I, we, I reached out to the administration. I said, I can make, so hospitals wanna be efficient too. They don't wanna pay overtime. And so, and then at the same time, you can talk about the benefits of having a dedicated fluoroscopic technician, a dedicated OR nurse and a dedicated uh, scrub nurse. And if you can demonstrate to them the efficiency, because a hospital gets a DRG value for a diagnosis, mm -hmm. right? So if you can say, look, if you do these three things, you can now do three cases in the same room instead of two. If you decrease your turnovers, this is value to the hospital. So you are leaving money on the table to the hospital. So uh, what you need to do in the end is 
demonstrate where the efficiencies can happen. And we've demonstrated that time and time again in, in, the, in the published literature. Um, and we also, we, we look at, um, nuts. You can edit this part out, I guess. Yeah. So the so you, you you look at identifying those uh, those points of uh, efficiencies that will translate immediately ben to the benefit for the employer, and then you go from there, and you control the controllables. Beautiful. On behalf of us and our listeners, thank you for your service. Great conversation. No, hey, privilege was mine. Thanks for having me. Mm -hmm.